Hello, everybody. Um, so as probably many people around here, I'm sort of fascinated by tra time travel. And I was thinking of how to introduce Doron and this project. And it occurred to me that if you just walk in this direction about one mile away from this campus, you can actually travel back in time 170 years and see uh, what was the first mechanical calculator based on the f uh, automatic calculator the f based on the first computer technology consisting of 8,000 parts and uh, weighing 11,000 pounds. So uh, this is a quite a travel to the past. And what's more interesting is actually a past that never existed. Uh, Charles Babbage that, that conceived of this machine of the difference engine number two, he never actually finished it uh, during his lifetime in the 19th century England. So, um, and it took 150 years and one dedicated person to actually, you know, make Babbage's dream a reality. And uh, that person is Doron Swade standing here. I'm gonna read this paragraph because it's kind of complicated. So Doron Swade is an engineer, a historian, and a museum professional. He, he has a bachelor's degree in physics and electronics engineering, master's degree in control engineering, and PhD in a history of computing. Uh, he founded a computer conservation society specializing in preservation of early computers. Uh, he's currently the assistant director and head of collections of the Science Museum in London. He's a guest curator of the aforementioned Computer History Museum and an honorary research fellow at the Royal Holloway University of London. And since this is the author's at Google Talk, um, Doran is, you know, you can suspect he's also an author. And his latest book called uh, The Cogwick Cogwheel Brain in the UK or the Difference Engine in the US uh, talks about his experiences in, uh, well, talks about the Babbage's life and his experiences in recreating the Difference Engine number two. And uh, people who know me know that I have an insane amount of computer history books at my apartment, it's like 700s mm -hmm. by now. Doron's book is still one of the ones that I love most. It's, uh, you know, it's probably in the top five. So. Um, yeah, it gives me a great honor and pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Doron Swade. Uh, Marcian, thanks very much indeed. Um, as Marcian mentioned, um, what prompts this talk is the arrival in Silicon Valley of this five-ton calculating engine which is down the road at the Computer History Museum. It will be on display there for one year. It will be demonstrated three times a week if it recovers from its jet lag. Um, it was flown over the Atlantic and suffered very badly. There was uh, corrosion from low temperature, high altitude. Uh, it was shaken up very badly. It was not um, actually intended when it was built, started building it six years ago to travel. Um, but it is running and uh, there is no substitute for actually seeing the engine live. Um, <clears throat> well, what can I do in 30, 40 minutes for you? I thought what I would do is tell you something about Babbage's life and times. What was the spirit of his times? What was the zeitgeist of the 19th century? There are common features with our own. Um, tell you something about his engines, just generally what was he trying to accomplish when he set about, spent his life's mission as it were from 1821 onwards, attempting to design, well designing, succeeding, and attempting to build these extraordinary, these vast machines. And finally, um, and the bulk of the talk will really be on difference engine number two, um, I sense both from feedback from Marchan and other, otherwise that the, t the audience is, has technical interests. So I will keep the history, not to a minimum, but I've tended to bias the whole treatment towards the engine and to show you and say things to an audience um, that could, is perhaps more appreciative of the technical aspects than would be um, to strictly to dwell on the historical elements. So, um, <clears throat> Babbage's world, the 19th century. We pride ourselves now that we live in an age of prolific invention. Barely a day goes by when there isn't some report in a newspaper about some breakthrough, some silver bullet, some new innovation. Um, <clears throat> it seems to be a signature of our times, pace of change, accelerated rate of innovation and so on. This is a daily motif, particularly for Silicon Valley and elsewhere. Um, the Victorians shared this rather frenzied sense of change. The middle decades of the 19th century were a time of unprecedented engineering ambition. It, they were obsessed with contrivances, devices, contraptions, mechanical things, machines. Uh, Thomas Carlyle, the essayist, said that it was the age of machinery in every outward and inward sense of the word. Outward and inward. It was not just the conquest of nature and the external world by technology, it was also an inward sense. They were the terms in which mechanism 
with the terms in which people understood the external world. It seemed that there was no predicate in nature or in human experience that could not be exhausted by mechanical explanation. Understanding became coterminal with mechanical explanation. And this was Babbage's world. This was the world he lived in. There seemed no end to the prospects for the industrial arts with new materials and new processes and manufacturers and products poured out of the manufactories and burdened shop shelves with new products, new things. So it was a time, as I say, of frenzied change and huge sense of innovation. <clears throat> the devices of the Industrial Revolution have one thing in common. They were designed to relieve or replace physical labor. <clears throat> but there was another revolution in the making that is less well known, possibly because it failed, and that is the revolution, that is the replacement of mental labor, specifically the mechanization of calculation through machines. The idea is that if a machine was autonomous, if it was automatic, and you could embody mathematical rule in mechanism, then you could achieve by physical exertion, which something you could only achieve up to that point in time by mental effort. And the idea was that this was a thinking machine. The, the movement failed. The pioneer of that movement was Charles Babbage, English mathematician, born 1791, died 1871, and his purpose, in a sense, was to extend the model of industrial production from thing to thought, from thing to thought, to extend the model of industrial production. That, as his son said, his machine would be a manufactory of numbers. This was an extension of the industrial model, the model of production, the solution to the problem of supply into the realm of mental effort. So, <clears throat> what have we got here with the steam horse? This is an example of something slightly bizarre. The front end, it's a steam, it's a steam railway, a street railway, with a front end built on with a horse. This is literally not to frighten the horses. We have here an example of bridging technology, of absorbing the new into the comfort zone of the familiar. And we have similar examples in modern times. The earliest electronic calculators were advertised as electronic slide rules. This is a way, if you like, of leveraging something new into the comfort zone, into the familiarity of something already known. So, very briefly, a thumbnail sketch of Babbage. Who was he? What was he trying to do? Where did he fit into, into London and English society? <clears throat> This is Babbage as a student in Cambridge in 1813. He graduated in mathematics. He was a crack man in mathematics. He tried to reform mathematics at Cambridge, which he regarded as very stuffy. So we have here already the notion of a reformer, someone who was radical. The resemblance to Napoleon is not accidental. England was at war with France. Babbage supported Napoleonic France. This is 1813. The Napoleonic Wars ended in 1815. So already you have a sense of radicalness, a sense of boldness, a sense of defiance in him. That's Georgiana, whom he married in 1814, uh, 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 1814 the year after this. This is a, a locket in the family, um, in, in the Babbage family, um, in defiance of his father, who thought it was imprudent for a man to marry without independent means. His father was a wealthy banker. <clears throat> we have Babbage here, age 53, as the man the gentleman of science, the man of science enjoying the esteem of his peers. This is an oil painting by Lawrence in the National Portrait Gallery. He had already been partially rehabilitated at this stage. He had um, shocked British scientific society by his sarcastic diatribes, his public attacks against the Royal Society for their poor governance of science in England. He was capable of incontinent savagery in these public attacks. He would impugn the personal probity of its senior officers. And he had no compunction and to, but to do this in public. This was about 1830. 1832, he in some sense redeemed himself by writing an, ex an encyclopedic volume called The Economy of Machinery and Manufactures, which is a turning point in political economy, where he examined the political economy of factories. This was a, a groundbreaking piece of work. So already by this stage, he'd been rehabilitated. 1830, he was the enfant terrible of, of London society, even though at that stage, he was aged 40. This is Babbage and its particular interest to us because it's around the time he designed Difference Engine Number no. 2, which was designed between 1847 and 1849. So this is a portrait by Claude, a photographic, so there's some confidence of realism um, within the constraints of photography. And there we have somebody still beaten up. He'd finished with his, he'd had his flaming row with Peel. He'd more or less given up 
any prospect of completing any of his machines, but still there is some fight left in him. He's still designing, he's still tinkering, he's still producing Difference Engine 2, which is perhaps a masterwork in the sophisticated and um, um, the economy of elegant design. And this is Babbage, it, that's the last known portrait of Babbage, taken at the Fourth Statistical Conference in London, 1860. This is what I call his Beethoven look. This is the venerable Grump. This is the, um, this is the um, his first biographer called him the irascible genius. And for all the scholarship since, this was 1963, for all the scholarship since, those two twin things, the irascibility and the genius, are perhaps the most um, compelling um, portrait of Babbage, um, despite all the other things that are now known about him. Um, protest always triumphed over persuasion. He was a raconteur, a socialite. He was a sought-after dinner guest. Mr. Babbage is coming to dinner was a coup for any hostess, you were assured, of entertainment and sparkling conversation. This was a bold man of great originality of startling sweep. He was a man of fierce loyalties. His friends could do no wrong, his enemies could do no right. He ached for honors and complained that the Lucasian professor of mathematics was the only honor bestowed on him by his country. He was offered a, a, a knighthood and refused it, saying this was to go to the engine, not to him. And since he had not built the engine, then um, he was unable to communicate um, his uh, vision. And we can see when we do get into the Difference Engine 2, the sumptuous piece of engineering sculpture, of just how bitter he must have been to have had this vision and been unable, through, the, through his failure to complete his engines, um, to communicate to any of his contemporaries. So let me give you some flavor of his writing. This is Babbage in 1851, writing in an obscure paper on taxation. One of the factors that affected whether he did or did not complete his machines was the entrepreneurial climate, climate in the mid middle decades of the 19th century. So this is Babbage writing on the entrepreneurial climate, again, in some obscure paper. Propose to any Englishman, any principle, or any instrument, however admirable, and you will observe that the whole effort of the English mind is directed to finding a difficulty, a defect, or an impossibility in it. If you speak to him of a machine for peeling a potato, he will pronounce it impossible. If you peel a potato with it before his eyes, he will declare it useless because it will not slice a pineapple. Impart the same principle to show the same machine to an American or to one of our colonists, and you will observe that the whole effort of the mind is to find some new application of the principle and some new use for the instrument. So already you have the familiar refrain, at least in Europe, that we have European innovation versus, if you like, United States commercial exploitation of markets. This is Babbage to Tennyson, the poet Tennyson. Excuse me. <coughs> Babbage to Tennyson. Sir, in your otherwise beautiful poem, The Vision of Sin, there is a verse which reads, quote, every moment dies a man, every moment one is born, close quote. It must be manifest that if this were true, the population of the world would be at a standstill. I would suggest that in the next edition of your poem, you have it read, quote, every moment dies a man, every moment one and one sixteenth is born. <laughs> the actual figure is so long that I cannot get it onto a line, but I believe that the figure of one sixteenth is sufficiently accurate for poetry. <laughs> now we have to believe that Babbage wrote this tongue in cheek. The terrifying thought is that he was deadly serious. Onto his engines, you have some flavor of who this man was. A bold, vigorous, radical man, proud, principled, easily taking offense, tilting at windmills, never hesitating to publicly denounce people whom he think it wrong. He, f he behaved as though being right entitled him to be rude. And I think that perhaps characterizes his public behavior. So, engines. <clears throat> The Genesis episode is 1821. Babbage and his great friend Herschel are sitting in London checking mathematical tables, that is, tables computed by computers. Computers were human beings. They did the low-level calculations. They're sitting checking astronomical tables. Um, Babbage becomes increasingly dismayed by the number of errors between the two uh, lists, manuscripts that were being compared, and clasps his hand to his head and says, I wish to God these calculations had been executed by steam. Steam being a metaphor both for the infallibility of the machinery, the unerring certainty of mechanical agency would ensure the integrity of results. Machines don't make mistakes, humans do. But it's also a metaphor for a model of production. It would solve the problem of supply. Astronomers were seeing asteroids and thought they were new planets and they needed to plot their trajectories and were pressing government to insist that the Greenwich Royal Observatory produce these tables. 
Greenwich Observatory was resistant. They said it was outside its mandate and charter. So the, the Astronomical Society, which Babbage was actually instrumental in founding, um, charged, commissioned Herschel and Babbage to do these tables. So there was a huge political context in doing this. Why were they sitting there checking tables? But this was the mechanical epiphany. From that point on, Babbage's life was dominated by the wish, the need, the aspiration to build these vast mechanical calculators that would eliminate all sources of error from printed production of tables. This, the errors in tables were, three, were fourfold. Firstly, there was the error of calculation, manual calculation. Secondly, there was the error of transcription. You had to copy the results down so that a, a typesetter could set them in loose type. Secondly, there, thirdly, there is the problem of setting each digit in loose type. This is not like language where there's some intuitive idea of what a spelling mistake or an omitted word or a scrambled word or a reversed syllable. Um, there is no intuitive way of knowing whether a, a number is wrong by inspection. Although typesetters, of course, were encouraged not to read what they were typesetting. They did it actually, quote, mechanically. They were encouraged not actually because one mind actually skips. It's very difficult. So. Um, um, finally, there was the question of verification. How, what confidence did you have once the tables were printed that these were accurate? So there were four sources of possible error, and the idea was the great, the, the genius, if you like, was a system, a complete system that would eliminate all forces. There would be an automatic typeset. It would print automatically, but not just a single inked copy. It would print stereotypes plates automatically as a mechanical automatic outcome that would allow you to reproduce results without human intervention. And we shall see that the implementation in Difference Engine 2 accomplishes precisely this. So 1821, Babbage sets about and he spends 10 years designing and developing Difference Engine number one that has um, 16 digits and six orders of difference. It's a Difference Engine because of the mathematical principle on which it's based with the method of finite differences. The beauty of the method is to evaluate a polynomial, ordinarily you need to do multiplication, division, subtraction, and addition. The beauty of the method of differences is you can get the same results and tabulate the answers by repeated addition only. So it does, you, you can eliminate the need for multiplication and division, which are very, very difficult to implement mechanically. He did subsequently, but certainly not in 1820s. So that's the plan, 1830s plan of Difference Engine 1. It um, would have weighed 50, it, it had 25,000 parts, would have weighed an estimated 15 tons. It was something like eight feet high. Um, and ran, ran on railway tracks, actually, it was so heavy. Um, this is all he ever accomplished. This is one-seventh of, um, of the full machine. And this exists, it's in the Science Museum in London, and the significance of this particular machine cannot be overstated. This is the first automatic mechanical calculator. You <coughs> operate a handle up there, you crank it, you set the initial values on the wheels, you crank the handle, and it's, um, you get results which up to that point in time you could only get by thinking. This is the first successful machine which has any sort of autonomy. This is the first successful transference of human intelligence to mechanism. The first machine that successfully embodies mathematical rule in mechanism. Reversing that, it's the first, it's the first machine that allows the ingression, if you like, of machinery into psychology. There are other significance to this machine. He used it to demonstrate his theory of miracles. He's, he, he, he programmed the machine for discontinuities. That is to say, after a fixed number of cycles, it would apparently break the rule and do something, there would be a disjunction in what it did. And Babbage, um, he demonstrated this at his soirees um, to the Glitterati of London, and he would argue that, um, that discontinuities in nature, which religion called miracles, discontinuities in nature actually were programmed, were programmed discontinuities. And while it seemed a violation of law, to us, to nat to, of natural law to us, the observers. It was actually a manifestation of a higher law, God's law unknown to us, unknown to us. And by analogy, he had programmed the thing for a discontinuity of a fixed number of cycles, and by analogy, therefore, miracles in nature were not, uh, discontinuities in nature were not necessarily miracles, but the product of causal um, determinism. And this sent a massive ripple through geologists at the time who, um, and pre-Darwinian evolutionists who were struggling for a model of discontinuity, why you could have eons with no new species and the sudden appearance of a species, why you had earthquakes, which forces which could only be attributed to some deity given their magnitude. How would you account for this? How would science compete with natural theology if it was wrestling for ownership of an account of the world? And this model, that is an, a very good example of how an object has influenced the history of ideas. The fact that you could have an autonomous machine, not just a speculation about mathematical singularity, but a machine that behaved um, in a programmed way but exhibited discontinuity, 
seem to, to, to provide compelling evidence for the fact that the world could be deterministic and they, are, they are, and they are a natural phenomena that you could account for without necessarily appealing to a deity. So for Babbage, God was a programmer. And those in the software industry may be flattered to know this. The significance that the machine was thinking was not lost on Babbage or his contemporaries. Um, Harry Wilmot Buxton, a junior colleague of Babbage's, wrote, the marvelous pulp and fiber of the brain had been replaced by brass and iron. He, Babbage, had taught wheelwork to think, or at least to do the office of thought. Lady Byron, that's Ada Lovelace's mother, wrote in a diary in 1833, last week we saw the thinking machine, for such it seems. So this was not lost on them. This was, if you like, the beginning of not only artificial intelligence, but also the beginning of automatic computation. You cannot have either of these without the machine being autonomous in some way, and this is the machine that symbolizes that fundamental transition from speculation to actual physical autonomy. You did not need to understand how the machine worked or the principle upon which it's based in order to get useful results, and this was unprecedented. The machine itself is a, is a, is a quantum leap in logical conception and physical size. There was nothing comparable, anything like it. It came, in a sense, from nowhere. This is Babbage, this is Ada Lovelace, this is Herschel. That is the actual very machine. And this is Babbage demonstrating his theory of miracles in his very famous soirees on Saturday. And the reason it's slightly blurred is because digital photography was not very good in the 19th century. <laughs> the vignette I've painted of Babbage and Herschel is misleading. And historians, myself included, endlessly charmed by it, have been misled into thinking that errors in tables was not only the jumping off point, which it was, but that it was the enduring motive for Babbage's designs. Babbage, for Babbage, the engines were a new technology of mathematics. His earliest writings do not mention errors. Errors enter only as a device of persuasion, as a rhetorical device when he had to justify these machines to the outside world in util utilitarian terms in order to get support. Babbage's real interest was mathematics. He saw the engine as a new technology to do mathematics. And there are at least three respects in which this was specifically so. He saw computation as a systematic method of solution, that you could find the solution for equations for which there was no analytic formula. He saw the machine as a heuristic device. You can cross-couple. You can cross-couple both forward and back, elements from columns. You can see the external shafts here, which allow a, a, a value from that wheel to be coupled to a value from that wheel using these external shafts with external coupling. So you could cross feedback. You could produce series for which there was no ge general solution for the nth term. So he saw this as a heuristic device. He saw for the first time computation as a method, method of solution. So the root of an equation is when the result goes to zero. All you need to do is to detect the all zero state in the last column, and the machine will halt, halt resonances of Turing. He talks about the machine halting when it finds a root. He says, crank it. If there is no solution to the thing, it will crank ad infinitum. This is Turing, pre-echoes of Turing in his solution to the problem of computability using halting criteria. This is explicit in Babbage. He also predicts a new branch of mathematics called numerical analysis, which will be devoted entirely to the optimization of mathematical formula for the purposes of machine computation. And the example he uses, he takes a formula, and he said to find the value of this, you will do 35 multiplications, 10 divisions, and 2 additions. He then rearranges the formula, which is mathematically identical, and says you can do the same thing with 5 additions and 2 multiplications and 1 division. And he said there would be a branch of mathematics that would ensure that, that, that mathematics, these formula, were pre-prepared to optimize machine computation. So this was Babbage's vision. New, it has been, if you liked, as I say, historians have been misled by the vignette and other things. There were errors in tables. The errata sheets in published tables um, absolutely evidence this. But this was not Babbage's original conception. The machines are decimal digital machines. They're decimal in the obvious sense. They use the numbers 0 to 9. They are digital in the sense that only discrete whole values of whole numbers are legitimate. So if a wheel is intermediate between two numbers, then the machine jams. It is designed to jam. Jams are good. It's a form of error detection. It says the integrity of the result has been compromised. A wheel is in an indeterminate position. So the, the, the number 2.5 is not represented by a wheel numbered in a value between 2 and 3. 
you have a wheel which has five and a wheel which has two, and we'll show you that presently. Each of the digits actually has its own wheel. It's a de de decimal digital machine. Now, what makes it digital? This is not inherently digital. This is not electronic flip-flop logic. These are not bistables where you exceed a threshold and the thing flips because the transitional states are not stable. Baby ch it's, it's, it's digital because the control mechanism makes it so. And I'll show you an example of Babbage's early attempts. Here you can see Babbage trying to digitize this. You can see that these half moons, that thing's on a spring. It has two actions. It locks when it's fixed and freezes that wheel. But also as the wheel goes, the spring attempts to buy. Okay, now the dwell angle over there, the dwell angle is actually not sharp enough to make a decisive transition. But you can see the beginnings of attempting to digitize, that this is stable, that is stable, and that is transitional. And you will know when that is proud of the indent whether it is actually in the correct position or not. So you can see the beginning of an attempt to digitize uh, this machine, even though it was decimal. I'm now going to show you, oh, OK. Um, let me read you just some of the features. Let me read you some of the features of Difference Engine 1. These are logical and system features, and I should emphasize, nowhere did Babbage ever use the terms I'm about to use. They're not abusive, um, but th th I, I'm, this is a kind of backward, backwards projection from our own age to actually make it intelligible. So this is Difference Engines. And these are circuit, what we would now call circuit and system functions. It includes a parallel bus, microprogramming, that is the automatic execution of the minor instructions given a macro instruction, pipelining, pulse shaping, binary latching, polling, I.O. certainly, and a bounce catcher, Schmidt trigger, to actually stop something bouncing which was added. So what I'm going to show you now is, okay, how do you do this mechanically? Again, nowhere did Babbage use these words. Pulse shaping, the cleaning up of an edge which becomes degraded which is something that we commonly do in electronics. So I'm going to show you a video now of how this thing pulse shapes. OK, let me stop it and explain something. This is a lock. It's a sword blade thing with a wedge-shaped device at the end. That's wedge-shaped at the end here. And the lock is going to go in and actually into the, between the teeth of these horizontal racks. Now, the lock has three functions in Babbage's designs. So the locks are the mechanism he used to digitize, to keep this machine digital. It's part of the control system. The lock has three effects. Firstly, if you get a wheel that deranges slightly, the wedge-shaped lock comes in and has a self-correcting action. Right? If it's a slight derangement, it will correct and recenter it. The lock, when it's fully inserted, will stop the wheel moving, so therefore it's not vulnerable at particular parts of the cycle where it might otherwise be deranged. Finally, if a wheel drifts more than two and a quarter degrees, either through drift, derangement, wear, or anything else, the lock will not go in and will hit the to end of the tooth and the machine jams. The machine is telling you the wheel is in an indeterminate position. It's between two digits. And you should stop because the integrity of the result has been compromised. This is one example of how this works. So this is the vertical lock and it's going to insert into those racks. Now, if you watch that very carefully, as it inserts, you can see the self-correction action. There should be sound on this. Okay. I don't know if you can see that correcting action there. As it goes in, you can see that slight shift. Yeah? That's it. Okay, let me run it again. The sound is actually quite interesting. Okay, so as the lock goes in, if we just watch one of these, you'll see there. See the correction? Correction. Right? It's self-correcting each time. Slight arrangement it goes in. Okay, that's fairly clear. Um, <clears throat> right. I mentioned one bit latching. Okay. One of the key things about it is when a, when a figure wheel goes above 10, it has to increment the next decade to carry. Carriage of 10 is crucial mechanism. Now, what's interesting about this is that he, he adds all the wheels together in one go. And if a wheel goes above 10, instead of incrementing as part of that action of going above 10, it sets a latch and says, this wheel has gone above 10. In the next part of the cycle, you must increment the next one, otherwise you'll get an incorrect result. So what it does is it has a one bit latch. The latch says, this wheel, this wheel went above 10 in the last cycle. So these are the latches. These are the wheels. So that's unwarned, that's warned, and that's carried. And what we're going to do is run this. What happens is that this helix sweeps around, and these um, carry levers pull each decade in turn. Right? It interrogates each latch in turn up the, up the register. And if it is set, if the latch is set, it will increment by one. If it doesn't, it misses it completely. So if we watch the intersection, the intersection of the locus of this shoe, on that lever, that lever, these levers, 
then when they're warned, they will intersect and carry. When they're not warned, and we'll run it now, and you can see how that goes. OK, now watch, watch this one, for instance. It's carried, right? I'm going to stop it and try and catch it in the middle. OK, that's carried. I'm going to try and catch it so you can. Too late. Got it. OK, it jumped from there to there. The latch is set. Now, you can see that the extent, the, these arms are in different positions. Right? One's further out, one's further in. One will set, one will not as it sweeps around the intersection of the loci. So that's a conditional device which interrogates each latch. If set, carries. If doesn't, you can see the two and then resets. I don't think that was very clear. If I can catch one, then you can see it. But that's what's happened. And the sound has gone again. Um, yeah? Is it this plug? Got it. OK. It's caught there in the, in the worn position, so it's unworn to worn. So the latch is set. And you can see that this one is set. That one's half carried. This one isn't set. So these arms are different. You can see that sticks out slightly further. It will then intersect or not intersect, depending on whether the latch is set or not. So it will either sweep. And the intersection of the two loci of those two trajectories will increment the next decade up. OK. <clears throat> Difference engines are calculating machines. They're not strictly general purpose computers. In 1834, Babbage conceived of the analytical engine, which startlingly embodies almost every significant feature of a modern digital electronic computer. This is his 1940 plan. This would be six to eight feet long, 15 foot high. These are registers. These are, are columns of figure wheels. If you look down on them, each of them has 50 digits in them. Precision, 50 digit precision, double precision arithmetic results up to 100 digits. Um, there are 19 or 20 registered here. Babbage talks about machines with entry-level machines with 100 registers and machines of 1,000 registers. A 20-register machine would be 10 foot long. The entry level is 100 registers. So this is a machine of monstrous proportions. You're talking about something vastly bigger than a steam locomotive. Um, let me read you some of the features um, of, well, firstly, the... Um, the, the, his attempts to build a difference engine number one failed. This was the biggest central trauma of his life. He never really recovered. He returns time and time again in his writings in dismay, in despair, in anger, in disbelief, as though unable to reconcile himself to the um, dismal outcome. This was in 1833 uh, when Joseph Clement, his engineer, walked out. The project was never resumed again. Government uh, withdrew funding in 1842. If you like the sagas of Victorian soap, there was a beautiful countess, a flaming row with the prime minister, public accusations of profligate and wasteful spending of public monies, experts who disagreed about the fundamental utility of the machines, and a walk-up by Babbage's chief engineer, Joseph Clement. Uh, we, we relived all of these in the uh, modern reconstruction, uh, except that I'm still waiting for the beautiful countess. <laughs> uh, this is the plan of the 1840s analytical engine, conceived in 1834. And... Um, let me just read you some of the logical features that this machine embodies. It's programmable using punched cards. Up there we see the punched cards, of which there were at least four separate types. It has an internal architecture, phenomenal architecture. It separates store and mill, that is processor from memory. It has a serial fetch execute cycle. It has conditional branching, if then statements. It is capable of iterative looping. It is capable of microprogramming, pipelining, anticipating carriage mechanism, which is not what we call look ahead. Internal repetitive operations, multiplication and division were automatic and internal uh, uh, features. A 50 to 100 digit precision. It had parallel processing. It output was printed, stereotyped, punch card, and had a graph plotter. This is all in explicit detail in his design. But the point is, again, nowhere does Babbage use these terms. So, it is not a question of suggestive hints. This is not the coded vagueness of Nostradamus. This is not 
a parvenu industry dignifying itself by claiming a false ancestry. This is not the backwards projection from our modern age onto the blank canvas of the past. All these features are explicitly embodied in the detail of design, and what I'll give you is just some flavor of the extent and detail of what he did. This is the plan of the printing mechanism, which is shared between the analytical engine and the difference engine. This is a device we've already built, and um, that's the one you can see down the road at the Computer History Museum. Um, up there is an example of his mechanical notation. This is a symbolic hardware description language developed specifically to aid and assist and optimize the designs. He was a mathematician. He thought n naturally in abstractions. This is a, um, a, the tabular form of his design. All these alphabets mean something. There are anything up to six superscripts and subscripts, which tell you the driving points, the nature, what each part is connected to, whether the motion is circular, linear, continuous, discontinuous, and so on. This is, is, so there are three forms. There's the tabular form I've just shown you. There's timing diagrams. This is his mechanical notation. There's the timing diagram, which shows how each part's are phased, the parts are phased. You can see the pipelining effect here. This is mirrored down there. Odds and even axes are dealt with separately. That may not mean much now, but actually this is how he worked it all out. He doesn't use 360 degrees. He uses 50 divisions in the cycle, um, which was actually not precise enough to deal with the very tight timing cycle. So we produced another one of these, which has much finer phasing. Um, and finally, this is his flow diagram. This is um, part of the, this is the third form of the mechanical notation. And interestingly, he has separated data from control, but they're on the same drawing. That is data input, and that's control. And this device is um, 4,000 parts, and that's the physical device that that formulation corresponds to. And this is the one that's down the road. That's the printing and stereotyping mechanism. And we use the notation actually to resolve issues that were not clear from the drawings. We can't talk about the analytical engine without talking about Ada Lovelace. And much has been claimed for her contribution. Four things are usually claimed for Ada. Firstly, she was a mathematical genius. Secondly, that she had an in influential contribution to the analytical engine, the Babbage's analytical engine. Finally, she was the first, pro thirdly, she was the first programmer. And finally, that she was a prophet of the computer age. There's only one of these that has any substance at all. <laughs> Firstly, she was not a mathematical genius. She may have been, but it was unknown. She was a novice. She was a promising beginner. She made a fundamental contribution to the analytical engine. Lovelace started studying elementary methods of differences in 1839. This is five years after Babbage had conceived the analytical engine. So there is no possibility. She, as encouragement, certainly. Um, uh, Babbage met Lovelace in 1833 when Lovelace was 17. Babbage was over 20 years older. There's no question he was flattered and he, she encouraged her. She was fascinated by the machines. But that she made any substantial contribution to the concepts of the analytical engine, the chronology just does not back up. Finally, she was the first computer program. This is excusable that people should think this because she was the person who published the first record of an algorithmic procedure. Her notes, 1843, on Babbage's analytical engine is the most comprehensive description of his analytical engine. But the examples were Babbage's. They were used in Turin in 1841. So Babbage was the first programmer. She was the first published program. The first thing that corresponds to a stepwise algorithmic procedure. She is deserved of her fame. I'm not rubbishing Lovelace here. I'm rubbishing the people who have lionized her for false reasons. She is absolutely deserved of her place in the Hall of Fame. She was the only one who saw what the fundamental significance of Babbage's analytical engine was and saw it saw further than Babbage did. She was the one who understood the fundamental transition from calculation to computation, that a computer was a machine that could manipulate symbols according to rules, that number could represent some entity other than quantity, that if you can have a machine that manipulated number and the number represented notes of music, letters of the alphabet, you had a computer. And she's, it's not, the, again, this is not a suggestive hint. She is banging on the table and saying, this is the significance of the analytical engine. General purpose computation through symbolic manipulation, according to rules. Babbage never saw the machines outside the domain and envelope of mathematics. He could see an algebra machine, but still within mathematics, where it could manipulate symbols where the specific um, value of each symbol was not necessarily critical. So that's my rant about Lovelace. She deserves a place, but because she saw beyond. She was responsible for that fundamental transition. She saw that the machine was different in kind, that a computer was different in kind from any machine that had gone before. Finally, difference engine number two. This is <clears throat> 
one of 20 drawings that Babbage left. Excuse me. One of 20 drawings of Babbage, most evocative of its overall shape. That's the main elevation, Bab 163A, imprinted on my mind. It's operated by cranking a handle. We have here the microprogram, a series of cam stacks. That's 28 conjugate cams, uh, ge geometric conjugates of each other, inversions of each other. Um, seven orders of difference. Tabular value over there. First difference, second, third, fourth, third, and seventh difference down here. The end product of the whole process of a single cycle is that a 31-digit number appears on this last column. That is the printing apparatus, which both prints hard copy and um, produces stereotype plates. The machine has 8,000 parts of bronze, cast iron, and steel. It is 11 foot long, it is 7 foot high, and it's made of bronze, cast iron, and steel. Um, the printer is of particular significance because it is programmable. You can program the format on it. It doesn't run Windows and it's not portable. Um, it crashes nearly as often, though. Um, 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 but crashing is good, as I say. It's error detection. Um, the printer is interesting because, I mean, the, the whole thing is interesting, of course. Um, but the printer is particularly interesting because you can actually program the format on the page. You have variable line height, variable column width. You can leave gaps between groups of lines for ease of reading. You can print in one, two, three, or four columns at will. You can, it, it stereotypes in two fonts simultaneously, small and large, and has line height that adapts according to the size of the font, and all this is entirely mechanically programmable. It will automatically line wrap or column wrap, whether you print down the page or across the page, and I'll show you examples of that now. This is the machine in all its glory. This is the one that was finished in London in 2002. It took 17 years to build. Strictly speaking, it was built over a period of 17 years. It was not just the logic of the building. There was something called people that were involved, and they are much less logical than solving technical difficulties, fundraising, publicity, all that stuff. So the, from start to finish, 1985 to 2002 was 17 years, and that's the end result. The one down the road at the Computer History Museum is an exact duplicate of this. In fact, it's a multiple original because we made two sets of parts for the printer in one go. So this is, in fact, a duplicate. The, the calculating section of the print is, in fact, a multiple original. And that is the machine um, that is down the, ro down the road. So there we can see the handle, we can see the cam stack, the printing mechanism, um, and the series of 10 columns. Numbers are stored in figure wheels, decade de uh, decimal digital machine. Uh, stored in columns, so it goes units, tens, hundreds, thousands from the bottom to the top, 31 digit precision. Um, that's an example of Babbage's design. Um, that's a, a figure wheel, a sector wheel, a figure wheel. This device there, that's a single mechanism which I'll show you now. And this fairground device is the helis, helix which runs up and down, which we will see, that thing that rotated to do the polling of each decade. And that is the most intricate device, and that's a modern piece by drawing. You can see how much more information there is on this than is on Babbage's original. So although Babbage specifies the thing entirely, you know what the shape is, you know what it needs to do, there's information which is not present. Methods of manufacture, tolerancing, choice of materials, and finish are not provided. We did that from, for all 8,000 parts from a knowledge of 19th century um, machines and an inspection of Babbage's own machines. We also did composition analysis on metals used by Babbage to ensure that we didn't actually um, make the machine from any higher specification material than was available to Babbage. Um, so, authenticity was the watchword of the project. We had to resist the charge absolutely of somebody saying, you built the engine, but Babbage could not have. So we were scrupulous in our interpretation of this. <clears throat> That's a simulation. By the way, I'd like to interest Google in doing a complete simulation of the analytical engine, and please see me afterwards. Um, and there is major work to be done on this. Also, to actually digitize the archive. Um, that is in London to make this available. At the moment, the archive is 70 miles outside of London. Three people have studied it. Um, one is dead, one is in his 90s, and me. And I'm not going to go on forever. This stuff needs to be made available to the public, and um, I think Google should adopt Babbage. End of advertisement. Um, <laughs> that's the back of engine, um, and that you can see down the road. And now I'm going to run the machine for you. There is no substitute for seeing this machine run, especially with Dickie sound. Um, so this is in the absence of going walking down the road. We're just going to run the machine, and you can see how it goes. That is, those are the locks coming in. Those are those sword blades, that slapping sound. There's taking an ink print copy. Cam stack microprogram. Shifting and turning. That's pipeline. Deals with odds, the odds axes in one cycle, half cycle, the evens axis in the other half cycle. So it's adding a number from there and the result ends up down there and then transfer to the printer. 
Okay, you can see the cam stuff. It's all greased up, so it looks horrible. The one in, down the road is much cleaner using uh, transparent grease. This is heavy machinery. This is big iron. That's the locking. You can see the syn synchronization of the sound with that. That's the lock coming in and out very quickly. Pressure angle is too great. We couldn't turn the handle when we first built it. Okay, we now go look at the front of the machine. And you'll see that shifting motion. Odds and evens go together. The odds axis 1357 go in one half cycle, evens axis the next. Who cares whether it works when it looks like that? <laughs> and that's the back of the engine. That's the carry mechanism. And if you held a pineapple up to it, it would slice it. <laughs> Those things are viciously sharp. You can tell a Babbage engineer by his hand. That's it. It's polling each decade in turn. It can also deal with secondary carries, carries as a result of carries. Um, that's the printing mechanism. Um, how are we for time? Um, yeah? And we can stop and do questions, or I can just carry on. There's not a lot to go. OK? Yeah? Um, OK. Um, I'm going to explain how the, the stereotyping printing mechanism works now through a simulation. This is the kind of thing I'd like Google to do, but better. Um, ah, um, I missed that. OK, I mentioned that, um, that it can print down the line and automatically column wrap, or it can print across the page and automatically line wrap. It does that automatically. You just set it up and it does it. So you can print, as I say, line to line or column to column. I'm just going to go back one um, to see if we can run the, run the simulation. OK, the, the problem is, how do you get a figure wheel in that plane, a value from a figure wheel in that plane, to a print wheel in that plane? So what Babbage does is he has a train which is sector wheels, horizont uh, uh, horizontal racks, spindles, and vertical racks. So when that turns, it just transfers the, uh, and, and transfers the result to that. That's the print wheel. That's, where, that's the bit that will be inked. And he's got 31 digits up. It prints to 30 digits, calculates to 31, prints to 30. So when these wheels turn, it transfers the result to the print wheels over there. And this is how it does it. <clears throat> so that's um, a feed roll, paper stock. New result is inked comes up, takes an impression, the act of coming up winds the paper on, then resets to zero, takes a new result, inks the new line of print, takes an impression, and just keeps cycling through. Yep. <clears throat> There's no sound to this. Virtual world is silent. Um. OK, what it then does <coughs> is start stereotyping at the same time. It does simultaneously. There's no printing overhead in this. OK, you've got trays of soft material. In our case, we use plaster of Paris. And there's an example of this on display down there in the very first experimental plaster of Paris tray we use. So it impresses results. These um, stereotype heads lower into the trays. That's the small font. That's the big font. The trays move at different rates to adjust for the line heights. They index at different rates. And you can see that the transfer of the results is then transferred to the stereotype plates. And we'll now watch that run. So that's just the stereotyping working now. The same vertical racks are transferring to the print wheels, transferring to the, horizontal, to the um, print heads, and impressing results in. Um, this was done in 3D Studio. It took too long to render full results, so we're only using three digits. Please help. Um, So you can see the trays index automatically, each line. It's a, got two degrees of freedom. 
and automatically jumps across when the page is, um, gets to the end of the page. And now we can see the whole thing run together in symphony. So a single result transferred to print wheels and to stereotype heads, takes an ink impression, that's for record keeping only, you can't reproduce it. From this you produce printing plates, which you then put in a printing press, you've eliminated the human from the loop entirely, from calculation to the production of stereotype plates. Um, now let's see if we can run this um, and show you how that actually works. So the, 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 the trays are driven by these falling weights. So you don't rely on the uniformity of the drive of the person at the handle to ensure the indexing is accurate. This is what determines the indexing. That's how it's programmed. That's the pattern wheels program the format. That's Okay, we can now can look closely at the ink bath. That's a cover. There's gooey ink in there. That's a print roller. This is a spreader roller. If you get a gap there, you can see this thing slides backwards and forwards. It's got a snail cam on the end. I'll do that. I'll accelerate it now. You can see it sliding backwards and forwards. So if there's a gap there, it actually smears it horizontally as well as vertically. That was done by hand. That doesn't do that by itself. It does it incrementally. And now we can actually look straight into the thing and see those are the print wheels where it receives the results. And we'll actually see it printing now. We'll get some hard copy. You can see how very, very fast, how quick the timing cycle is. Watch that print wheel come down now. Boom, boom. It has to get out of the way before it comes out. Um, and as I say, that sweep automatically advances the paper. So the new result, inked, impression, sets to zero. Now we'll see it actually picking up a result. And you can program it to put an index there. So it's actually got the independent variable, 131. We'll see the next one is the next. So x is increasing from 131 to 132. And that'll be up to a 30 minus 3 digit, 27 digit result. So that's what it's doing. I mean, the simulation sort of gets the logic of it done. OK. What happened? This is a. <coughs> <laughs> this is a monolithic machine. It is hardwired. It is phased. The cam stack orchestrates the internal motions. But there is no room for adjustment. They'd never built a machine of any complexity. You cannot uncouple the printer from the machine. When it jams, best you can do is hunt and peck. You poke around with the first, world's first logic probe to see where it is solid, where there is give, where there isn't. So you lever up on the sector wheels, on the, on the figure wheels to see, is it stuck? Is it jammed? You fiddle with the locks to see, is it stuck? Is it jammed? <clears throat> um, this is the book that tells the account of trying to build a machine for the bicentenary in 1991 of Babbage's birth. It stops in 91 where the calculating section is built. The American edition is slightly updated because by that stage, uh, 2002, the printing section had already been updated. So there are, there are photographs of the printing section in the American edition. The cogwheel brain was intended, the title was intended to capture that ambiguity of Carlyle of inner and outer sense, the terms in which you saw the world and the terms in which um, you interacted with the terms in which you saw the world and the fact that the mind, that, that there was a computational view of consciousness which only arose once you had autonomy, autonomous machines. Um, but the, the books, the text of the books are essentially identical. And I thought I'd just finish with a sumptuous piece of engineering sculpture. Thank you. I understand that the mics are to be used for questions, so I'm instructed to inform you of that. Um. So how was exactly data input into machine? How was the initial data input? Right, the only input you can provide is to enter initial values. So you enter the initial values by entering them by hand onto the figure wheels, but you have to disable the security mechanisms that prevent you deranging the machine. Mm -hmm. Babbage challenges you and says, walk up to the machine even when it's functioning and attempt to derange it externally and you won't be able to. So you have to disable those mechanisms and then you enter the, the, the numbers by hand. The numbers are pre-calculated. So the starting value of x mm -hmm. and the value of all the differences for the starting value of x and for a particular polynomial with its coefficients. Mm -hmm. 
So all terms, x to the 7, x to the 6, et cetera, et cetera, with any coefficient, positive or negative, um, um, can be calculated and tabulated. Mm -hmm. And you do a pre-calculate by hand a setup table, taking account of the odds-evens pipelining offset, and you enter these numbers as a setup procedure at the beginning. And before you do that, you have to um, disable using those levers and this lever over there. You have to disable the security mechanism to free the wheels up. You set the odd axes in one part of the cycle. You then lock them. You then advance the machine to the evens axis setup point. You set all the evens axes. That's axis two, three, five, two, three, two, <laughs> two, four, six, eight. Um, and then you uh, lock the engine, take it to zero, undo the manual locks, and off you go. From that point on, every cycle of the machine produces the next value in the table. Thank you. I know that Babbage was aware of binary arithmetic, yes. or I read that. Um, do you think it would have been easier to use if he'd used binary? Babbage considered all uh, practical number bases, 3, 5, 7, 12, 15, 100 and of course binary. He chose decimal because of engineering efficiency. The lower the base, the uh, larger the number of moving parts. So it's not only just familiarity of, of decimal system which is useful, um, but it was a good balance. If it was hexadecimal, duodecimal, he would have had to have a translation process. So he chose a familiar binary, but it's digital. And he explicitly says this is for economy. This is to minimize the number of moving parts. Thank you. Uh, was the uh, logic probe specified by Babbage? <laughs> um, no, but he never built the machine. And I believe had he, he would have had every single thing adjustable. He would have had what we call test points. He would have facilities for uncoupling the printing mechanism and the... Uh, I've actually insisted they put a clutch in here. You can see the printing mechanism is driven from the main drive. I put an extra handle on and a clutch. Otherwise, to drive the printer, you have to drive the engine. Firstly, you're 11 foot away from the person who's operating it. When doing fine adjustments, it's, it's impossible. Secondly, there are times where you want to run the printer. Once you've set the machine up, the moment you turn the handle, the internal state has changed. So if you then have to adjust the printer, for instance, to get the ink flow running, you want to run the printer without running the engine, I've got to redo the calculation. So you want to prime the printer by being able to cycle it separately. So I arranged the clutch there, which actually uncouples the drive, and it's been absolutely invaluable. Every modification of that kind is reversible. And we used almost everywhere um, solutions that we found Babbage had used elsewhere. Um, Did you find any bugs in his designs as you were building the machine? I assume there must have been in something so big. That's a very good question. Um, we found nothing that compromised the basic logic of his design. There was nothing that compromised the basic logic. But there were countless modifications. Um, for example, the um, elevation of the printing mechanism shows the print wheel, the inking wheel, um, suspended in midair. There's no visible means of support. So what does it mean to build this machine to Babbage designs? You make the inking roll and you hold them up and you let them go. Um, I mean, it's not practical. So this was quite a curatorial dilemma. Um, in what sense would we be building Babbage's engine if we made any modification at all? And the breakthrough came with the realization that Babbage's designs are not a work of unimpeachable perfection. This is an arrested engineering project. So for example, there are parts that are inconsistently dimensioned on different drawings. So the part in one drawing may be one thing and something else. You have to resolve this. There are omitted mechanisms. There are redundant mechanisms. There is one fundamental flaw that is so profound, it's almost mind-boggling. The carry mechanism would not work, not because it's not logical, but because the wheels go in the wrong direction. <laughs> I mean, it's that fundamental. Now, we speculated. Was this deliberate? Was this a drafting error? Was this an anti-espionage device? Um, how much supervision did the Babbage have over the... So, we had to resolve it. What we did was used exactly the device, but mirror imaged it. There was only one device whose design we had to improve, and that was a clutch, the rewind clutch. When you crank the handle, the printer automatically halts the machine at the end of a page, so you never have to calculate how many cycles you do. You just print, do it until it gets there, And it freezes the machine, so the machine will not overrun, so it's ready for the next cycle. Now, the clutch that rewinds, and then automatically these, these weights rewind. You don't have to wind them up by hand. You wind one by hand, the other one winds automatically. The clutch that does that needs to both turn and slide. And the turning, the torque, was too high to get it to slide. That was it. So we designed another clutch in the same space using a very similar mechanism, but which relieved that stress. That was the only device we actually had to change. There are a large number of things that we added. These counterbalancing weights, for instance, on the printing the vertical racks are not Babbage. These reinforcing brackets are not Babbage. The handle I've explained is not Babbage. This uh, counterbalancing spring underneath is not Babbage. All of them are removable, and all of them are solutions. That counterbalancing spring is based on Babbage's original spring up there. 
So everywhere we, we paid very careful attention to issues of authenticity. So the drawings are all the kinds of things you'd expect from a set of drawings that never went to a workshop. They're intact, but there was a lot of information that had to be provided, which Babbage would have had to solve. We solved it with the finest attention we could to knowledge of practice of the day. Uh, how does Babbage's budget compare with what you actually spent? I know it's rather <laughs> hard to compare. But... <laughs> uh, Babbage had a blank check from government. He spent 17,500 pounds of, Babbage, of government money in uh, between 1822 and 1832. I, I estimate that to be about $200 million now, and the government got practically nothing for it. Um, they got one-seventh of the engine which they gave to Babbage and said, sorry. Um, um, I'm not at liberty to disclose how much this costs because actually it's not because it's on being secretive, but because it's quite difficult to unbundle. I was a staff member, my research time was not costed. But I can tell you what the insurance value of this machine is, and that's based on what it would cost to replace in the event of ir ir irreparable damage or loss, total loss, and it's between two and a half and three million dollars. So we could build one from scratch with the knowledge we have from, uh, for about that sum. Uh, Baby spent two and a half, two hundred, the equivalent of two hundred million dollars, and um, didn't finish. Um, we did it for substantially less. And if Google wants one for the foyer, I'm taking orders. <laughs> <laughs> We're actually out of time, so I want to thank you so much for coming to Google today. Thank you.